just wanted to mention a few extra things about thunderstorms. And when, when I'm talking about regular thunderstorms, I'm talking about garden variety thunderstorms. So regular thunderstorms, not the severe stuff, not the stuff that produces tornadoes or super large hail, just a regular thunderstorm. Those occur quite often. Now, the average diameter of these are about five to 10 miles. And again, that's average. They could be smaller, they could be bigger. They typically produce gusty winds, heavy rain, and small hail, meaning hail that's like pea-sized. Their lifespan is 20 to 30 minutes, and again, they can last a lot shorter, or they can last a lot longer. Primary hazard, and the benefits actually can be flip-flopped. A primary hazard would be lightning. Um, a primary hazard could be rainfall if it's way too much, as in flash flooding. A benefit is rainfall, because rainfall is good for the ground. It's going to give you your ground moisture and have lots of flowers to grow and you know all that. Lightning's a benefit too, which might kind of surprise you. But lightning is the only way that you return atmospheric nitrogen back into the soil. And obviously that's good for plants right there. Now, thunderstorm, like annual thunderstorm days, you might think the Midwest holds a record to that, but they don't. It's actually the number one spot you're gonna find thunderstorms is in Florida. Florida has a very unique setup where in the summertime they have winds that come off the Gulf of Mexico and winds that come off of the Atlantic and they meet in the middle of the state and they force the air to rise so they produce thunderstorms because obviously there's a lot of moisture just kind of hanging down there. And that happens in the summertime a lot and if you've ever been down in Florida you know that basically in the afternoon, 1-2 o'clock in the afternoon, you can pretty much guarantee there's going to be thunderstorms around, especially if you're away from the beach, because that happens away from where the waters or the air from the water is being rushed in. So if you're just laying at the beach, you can turn around in the afternoon and notice that, oh hey, look, looks like there's a big thunderstorm cloud that's formed and there's rain going on just not too far from where the actual beach is. But typically, unless there's some type of frontal system, it won't be on the beach, it'll be inland a little bit. So Florida is the number one spot to find thunderstorms, and again, regular thunderstorms. The Midwest obviously sees quite a few because, well, we're in the Midwest, we're in that area where we're you know, between continental polar and the maritime tropical air masses. And you can see everywhere in the United States has that potential of having thunderstorms. Even Alaska can have some. And again, all you need is the right ingredients, which can be anywhere um, at any time, you know, if conditions are, are correct. So it's possible. Now, if you're going to look at it in terms of severe weather, now, of course, then the, the Midwest would be the one we would win out on that. Because we're the ones that typically have the severe weather, somewhere anywhere in the Midwest, from Texas all the way up to parts of the Dakotas, and then, of course, from Colorado all the way across to the Tennessee Valley. So it's possible to get more severe weather in that area, but again, severe where weather is thunderstorms is different than regular thunderstorms. At least the ingredients needed are slightly different and obviously the outcomes can be slightly different. Speaking of all these ingredients, again for a regular thunderstorm you need instability. Instability meaning that you have extra heating going on, something's destabilizing the atmosphere to make to allow air to rise a lot easier. You need something to lift that air, a front, a dry line, a trough line, which is a wave of instability. Basically, some instability pieces that are pushed out ahead of troughs. And moisture. If you don't have moisture, you don't get clouds and, well, you don't get thunderstorms. Severe thunderstorms take a little bit extra. Takes those three plus some extra ones and we'll go over that in a minute. Now the actual thunderstorm stages, you've got your updraft, sometimes called the initial and it's all updrafts. It's those puffy, nice, pretty looking um, cumulus clouds in the afternoon. If it continues to grow, it becomes mature. It'll have updrafts, it'll have downdrafts, it'll have both. If you're gonna have a tornado, if it's gonna be severe, it'll be in this stage. Now, if you're also looking at it, especially more from a distance, it'll look more crisp and a lot more easy to pick out features. If it's in the dissipating stage, it's gonna be fuzzy, you're not gonna really be able to pick out any features in it. And you're only gonna have downdrafts, so it's basically gonna be raining itself out. We've got a couple thunderstorm types. You have the MCC, or sometimes called the MCS, which stands for Mesoscale Convective Complex, 
or mesoscale convective system. Those things are very large areas of thunderstorms, so lots of lift in one area. They can be as wide as an entire state, and typically they're never severe. Again, there's always weird circumstances that happens, but they're usually always just regular thunderstorms, and it's a big, huge mass of it moving through. They're typically associated with the low-level jet, and when the low-level jet starts to die off, which is typically around 10 o'clock in the morning, that's usually when those thunderstorms are starting to wrap up. You get squall lines, which are off of a cold front or a dry line. They're one solid mass, like a line of thunderstorms. They can be severe and typically are. Um, they can be, they can give you lots of wind, like damaging, widespread damaging winds of excess of 60, 70 miles an hour, maybe even more. They don't typically have tornadoes with them, although again, situation arises, they can. And if they do, a lot of times it's uh, uh, along the gust front, so what they call a gust nato, which still can be very damaging. And they can have, especially at the end of the line, because eventually there's got to be an end to that line. Those on the end have a potential of having tornadoes. Multi-cell thunderstorms are the ones that are just clusters together, so those clusters of storms together. Again, those typically aren't severe either, and it's a lot of them that we get actually here in the, in the, in the Midwest, not counting all the severe ones, because actually as many severe ones, it's actually a small number when you look at the overall how many thunderstorms you get, even though it seems like it's all we get. And then, of course, you got your supercell. I didn't list that as number four, but your supercell, which is one individual storm that's severe. Now, the number one killer in storms, or just anything weather related, is actually flash flooding. You know, if you're talking about a hurricane, or if you're talking about just thunderstorms moving through. And that's because a lot of people just assume they can make it through, and so they'll drive through, and something will happen. So flash flooding is the number one actual killer. And if you look at a chart of the ratio of deaths per um, weather event, hurricanes are typically the lowest. Because when you get days notice that these things are coming in, it's not like these things just pop up overnight and slam the coast. You got days of notice for, to evacuate people out. And the deaths that you do get from it are usually from the people who just refuse to leave. Tornadoes obviously can. You get some good warning time with tornadoes. You can get upwards of 15, 20 minute lead times. But generally, if you talk about an average, it's probably more like 10 minutes. Which again, if you're paying attention to what's going on and you know that the potential of tornadoes in your area and you're already prepared and you know exactly what you're going to do if you hear that siren or if your weather radio goes off, then 10 minutes is plenty of time to get to safety. Unless you have to actually drive to your safe spot, then that doesn't really work so much. Lightning can be um, a pretty big killer. And again, a lot of that's from people going outside after the storm or even before the storm gets there and they think that because the storm hasn't technically arrived and it's not raining yet that they can't be struck. But you can be struck from a very far distance um, away from lightning. If you can see it, you can still be struck. And especially if you can hear it, then you're definitely too close. So keep that in mind. They usually give you the 30-30 rule that you should wait 30 minutes after, especially after hearing the last thunder and it's even best if you wait until you really can't see it because there has been instances and again that's rare but it's possible where people have been struck by lightning even though they couldn't hear it but they could see it in the distance of course flash flooding is number one now the difference between a watch and a warning watches or conditions are favorable for development a warning means it's actually happening there's a great test question it will be on the final is what's the difference between a watch and a warning and you would have to tell me specifically that the watch has conditions that are favorable for development. Doesn't mean it's happening, it just means all the ingredients are present and it could happen. Now a warning means it's actually taken place. Tornado warning, the tornado's on the ground or it's spotted on radar. Hurricane warning, it's the hurricane's actually there. Flash flood warning, the streets are actually flooding. I mean, that kind of thing. A watch, tornado watch, where the conditions are favorable for the development. Hurricane watch. A hurricane is developed and it's on its way. So keep that in mind. 
Um, if it's going to be a severe storm, the National Weather Service defines it as having one of the three. So all you need is one, and you can be con considered a severe thunderstorm. You can have all three as well, but just one will get you the, the classification of a severe thunderstorm. Uh, let's see, wind gusts, sustained wind gusts of 58 miles per hour. You've got to have hailstones greater than an inch, so that's a quarter size, and a presence of a tornado. And that'll get you the classification. Of course, if you have a tornado, they just turn around and they call it a tornado warning instead of a severe thunderstorm warning. But that obviously, if you got a tornado, you're still a severe storm. Now, lightning and thunder. Um, a lot of people don't really know why lightning happens. So I thought I might take a little brief moment to, to talk about lightning. And I'm assuming everybody realizes that thunder and lightning are the same thing. Lightning is the sight that you can see, and then the thunder is the resulting sound you hear from the actual lightning. Now lightning is formed when the thunderstorm cloud um, starts to separate the charges. In a cumulonimbus cloud, you've got some water at the bottom and you're going to have ice at the top. So the formation of that ice in the upper part of the, the cloud actually um, separates the charges, like the positives and the negatives within the cloud. Well, if you get a separation of charges, that's when the Earth can't stand it, because remember, the Earth doesn't like to be out of balance, and you know that from several different things. You know if you know there's hot air, hot air rises, well, something's got to be replaced underneath it, and so you get that pressure gradient force. Same thing with the water current. You got cold water sinking. You're going to have to have that you know, replaced by something else. So the Earth is always trying to get itself back into balance, and lightning's no different. So if the, sep the charges are separated within the cloud, it's got to the Earth has got to some, find some way of fixing that imbalance, and it does that in the form of lightning. So it's going to move charges from one place to another. So it can move it from cloud to cloud. It can you know, go cloud to ground. So it has options. It doesn't have to just go to the ground. It, you see cloud to cloud, you see end cloud lightning. Again, it's, that's the way the Earth's trying to fix that imbalance of those separation of those charges. Now lightning is extremely dangerous because it has high amperage and it has high voltage. So it's got both of those. That's the big difference, especially being high amperage. So it's not only when it comes through, it's it's extremely high, you know, it's, it's hot, obviously, it's, it's lightning, and that amperage is what really does a lot of the damage. When it strikes a person, it can really mess with the nervous system because it, obviously when lightning strikes you, it's going to go through you and it's going to take the path of least resistance, and if, which would be your central nervous system. That would be the easiest way to transfer all that through. So obviously very dangerous. Now the thunder part of it, when you hear thunder, you're hearing that because of the lightning and the reason why is when that lightning being again it's so hot it's hotter than the surface of the sun it goes through the air you have rapid expansion if you think about it you know air rises it expands and if you send something that hot through it it's going to make the air expand and it happens so quickly and so violently that sound that that you hear is that those motions going on translates to your ear of sound and you hear what we, we know as thunder. Now, why do you get a big clap versus a rumbly thunder? Rumbly thunders are from the ones that have what they call step leaders. So it's not just one bolt that goes straight to the ground. Most of the time what's happening is you have several of these what they call step leaders shooting out from the cloud trying to connect with the opposite charge. And most of them are what they call misfires. So they shoot out but they don't actually connect. Now most of the time you'll get one connection. Going back to the other slide you can see all these little bitty pieces are all ones that are misfires. Here's the one that made its connection, the actual bolt of lightning, and these again are all the other misfires. But every one of these that are going through here is rapidly expanding the air. So the more you got these, the more you're going to hear rumbly thunder because you're going to hear it at different times. So you're going to hear this portion of it, different from this portion, different from this portion, and that takes some time for all those to get to your ear. So you'll hear the first wave come through rumble, the next wave come through rumble, and so forth. So the more misfires, the more rumbly the thunder is going to end up being. And of 
course, the longer the lightning path, the more rumbly you're going to hear that thunder too, because again, it's rapidly and violently expanding the air, you know, longer distances. So that's kind of a quick little thing on thunder. If you, that whole thing that you ever hear about the five second roll, so you see the bolt of lightning and you count five seconds, like go oh, like one, one thousand, two, one thousand, all the way up to five. Well, every five that you count, the distance is one mile, uh, roughly one mile away from you. So that works out actually pretty good. And if you hear, hear and see it at the same time, well, that's because you're, you're right there on top of it. All right, so what makes a storm severe? So remember, you had those other three ingredients. You had to have the moisture, had to have the instability, you have to have something to lift it. But you also need what's called vertical wind shear. So what you need is winds changing directions as you go up and high. So at the surface, the winds, let's say, are out of the south. When you go up, maybe they're out of the southeast. You go up again, maybe they're more out of um, the east, or that kind of thing. So you need the difference in wind direction as you go up. You can also do what they call speed shear, where it can be the same direction, but if the winds increase very rapidly from the surface up, then that can impart spin. And for the wind shear, especially when you're talking about different directions, kind of think of it like if you're walking down a really crowded hallway and say that one side is walking one direction and the other side's walking the opposite direction and you're in the middle. Well then if you were, if it's a tight enough quarters, you could be bumped by one side of it and the other side of it. And eventually that's going to impart some spin on you. And that's kind of the same way that it works in the atmosphere. So here's a cumulonimbus cloud. A couple features, the anvil, what they call the overshooting top. You see that overshooting top, that's where the updraft is. You've got, obviously, there's the tornado, there's the wall cloud. There's what they call the flanking line, so it's the energy feeding into the storm. So a couple of nice little features. Here's would be the storm motions going towards the northeast. And this would be the leading edge. So you get your gusty winds if you had any. Start with light rain, heavy rain. Eventually you get to the hail. And right where the tornado is, there is no rain, there's no hail, there's no nothing where the actual tornado is. That's because it's all updraft, it's not downdraft. Now the tornado can be encased in rain, meaning that it's raining all the way around it, but not where the tornado actually is, because that's an updraft. Here's what it would look like on radar, at least a, a very classic one. Got that rotation moving around the central point, so your tornado somewhere in here. And here's all the heavy rain being wrapped around it. And in this case, the storm's kind of moving off this direction. Since so we're kind of touching into tornadoes, um, tornado locations, obviously, you can get them again anywhere that the conditions are set up, but typically you get a lot more in what they call Tornado Alley, which does not include the Kansas City area. We're close to it but we're not technically in it. It goes up Nebraska and extends down into Oklahoma and parts of Texas. Those are areas you typically find a lot more tornadoes. And again, not that you can't get them anywhere, but you typically see a lot more in what they call Tornado Alley. We use the Enhanced Vegeta Scale to measure tornadoes. It's based off of a three second wind gust. It's a little more accurate than it used to be. It used to be just done off of damage, which doesn't really work in this day and age with the buildings the way they're built, because they're obviously built much better now than they were back in the, the olden days. And of course, you get a wide range of buildings. You've got brand new ones that are built to withstand a lot of this stuff, and then you've got um, stuff that's been built back in the 30s that obviously would crumble a lot more. So the three second wind guess is a little more accurate way of, of checking it out. They still go out and look at the damage and that gives them some extra feedback, but that's how they now do the classification. And looking at, and this again only goes to 1994, but it still kind of holds up. You get, when you hear about tornadoes, they're usually the weak ones, the F0, the F1s that do very minimal damage. Your actual severe, like violent tornadoes is less than 1%. And again, it always seems like we're talking about a ton of them, but really when you look at the overall, less than 1% are actually those big baddies, which is good. I mean, you don't want them to be like the number one. That would be awful. Now, overpasses, I have to make a mention of this, are not safe. 
There's some news crews back in the late 90s, mid late 90s, had made it sound like this was the best place. They had gotten up underneath an overpass, they filmed it, a tornado passed by them but not over them, they were okay, and so everybody thought that is the best place to be. Until people actually took refuge under there when a tornado actually passed right over the top of the overpass. And if that happens, those winds are so intense it creates a wind tunnel effect and it will push you out. 